Thank you. Hello. Well, you've just heard that I'm a multimedia artist, and the first thing I've got to explain today is that I've had uh, two lives, and my first life ended in 1996 when I had a severe stroke at the age of 39. The first um, 24 hours after my stroke were pretty dramatic. Felt as though I'd had uh, an almost total system breakdown. And I can remember death feeling very close. It was almost as though I could reach out and touch it. And what was really strange was the whole experience was very peaceful. And I also remember very calmly deciding I'm not ready to die yet. And so began my second life. The strokes left me with a considerable amount of residue, which you've probably already detected. I have speech problems. I have problems with access to words. And I also have very bad memory problems, which is why I need to refer to notes and also to use slides to remind me what to say. I've also got uh, double vision. And so I see two of everything. And when I was informed about today, I was told there would be 100 people in the audience. And so I'd like to thank all 200 of you <laughs> for being here to give up your time to listen to me. Today, I'd like to focus on my second life and how familiarity has helped with my recovery. Urban legend has it that 100 years before my stroke, the absence of familiarity caused terror in a room in Paris in 1896. And it was caused by the screening of this 50 seconds black and white silent film. The story goes that when the audience first saw this, they ran screaming to the back of the room. And today this may seem remarkable, but the thing to bear in mind is those people may never have seen film before. So although they would have recognized the train, the image of the train, and known it was a projection, and known they were in a room, the power of seeing this image for the first time made them believe they were going to die. Going forward in time, over 100 years, this was a scan of my brain taken a few years after my stroke. This is the right side of my brain, and it's what's referred to as my good side, and friends say I should show people this side when they want to take a photograph of me. <laughs> so the stroke affected the left-hand side of my brain and right side of my body. At first, I couldn't walk or crawl or turn over in my bed. I couldn't eat or drink and I was in pain at all times, very severe pain. I could see light, but not detail, and I felt very, very ill. I'd been placed on a neurological transport ship, and I was transferred to a place where very little seemed familiar. So I couldn't create sculpture or even lift a camera, so instead what I decided to do was keep a diary, but I couldn't see clearly enough to write. So instead, I drew the shapes of words from memory in the hope that somebody would be able to understand them at a later date. And this is an extract from the diary. And it reads, I'm acting in a foreign film, but I don't understand the language that's being spoken. And it went on to say, words appear beneath my feet, white on black. You can see them, but what about me? And this was in response to the feeling that everybody seemed to know what was going on, but no one thought it was worthwhile telling me. In 2004, I made a film based on this diary. And this is probably the image that best sums up the feeling of isolation and confusion I experienced at that time. Then a couple of years later, I was on a bus, and somebody said something to me that further increased my confusion. I was standing holding a grab rail, and a woman came up behind me with a child's buggy and she was pushing the buggy into the back of my legs repeatedly. It was really painful, and all I could do was turn around and say, excuse me, I'm disabled, to which she replied, people like you shouldn't be on buses. And I remember thinking, you know, people like me, you know, what did she mean? And simple as it was, that experience affected my artwork as I began my recovery, including this work, which is an exhibition in Exeter Cathedral of 3D, fabric prints. The thing with these prints is when the visitors came into the cathedral, all the imagery looked very flat and perfectly symmetrical, but when they put on the 3D specs, it came alive, the images came alive, and there were variations in line and, and contrast and texture. 
And in the same way, if the woman on the bus had chosen to find out more about me, she wouldn't have uh, jumped to conclusions about who and what I am. From the point of view of being an artist, I hesitated then, I thought you might run to the back of the room when you see this <laughs> image of my face. From the point of view of being an artist, uh, stroke was fascinating and still is fascinating because when things break down, it often offers insights into how they function when they function correctly. And so it was with stroke. I'd lost touch sensation down the left side of my face. And when, if I touched the left-hand side of my face with my unaffected left hand, I could feel my face from the outside, but not from within. And this was profoundly disturbing. It was as though I was touching someone else, was it at the same time knowing it was me. For the first time in my life, my perception of self and environment was confusing. And I realized that I'd, I must find new pathways to familiarity. And on this journey, I saw things that I hadn't valued before. For instance, when I was discharged from hospital, I was living in a flat and I'd sit in the doorway, the front doorway, pretended to read each day it was for about three months. And I couldn't see clearly enough uh, to read, which is why I was pretending to read. All I wanted was for people walking by to think I was normal. And it didn't occur to me that sitting on a doorway, in a doorway for three months every day, pretending to read a book, wouldn't exactly look normal. And at that time, the leaves on the trees were still green. It was late summer. And for the first time in my life, because I was there each day, I witnessed a slow transition from green to the beautiful colors of autumn as autumn set in. And at that time, I was able to walk again, uh, like now with the aid of a walking stick. Uh, but I wasn't able to run like I did before. And, and when it rained before my stroke, if it was raining heavily, I'd, like yesterday, I'd run for cover and shelter, but I couldn't do that anymore. And this forced me to experience and accept and enjoy for the first time the rain as it touched my skin and soaked into my clothes. Over recent years, I've been working with uh, neuroscientists and psychologists at Brighton and Sussex Medical School and Staffordshire University in England investigating how exposure to the natural environment can make us feel better. The word familiarity has cropped up many times. For instance, in my collaborations with the neuroscientists, we appear to have found that the beneficial effects of listening to natural sounds, such as the sound of the sea or the wind, are significantly increased if the sounds are familiar, if we recognize the sounds. One explanation is that familiarity can make us feel safe and secure. Familiarity can also lead to new and unexpected ways of thinking. Recently, I've been creating portraits of adults with cerebral palsy, exploring disability and perception of self. This is Sammy and Kevin. These are two of the group I've been working with. And they've got limited mental control and can talk. Something else they share is they're in love with each other. To communicate, they use artificial speech devices. And last week, Sammy and Kevin very kindly allowed us to time them talking. And it took Sammy two minutes, 20 seconds to say this. I love you, Kevin. It took Kevin two minutes, 55 seconds to reply. I love you too, Sammy. What struck me about this when I first met Sammy and Kevin, was I was thinking, if we think back to arguments we've had in the past when we become angry or irritated, what would happen if when we have an argument, we have a, an agreement that we won't respond to the other person until waiting, we wait for 30 seconds. It would diffuse anger and bitterness and aggression in an argument. From the moment we're born, we strive to become familiar with and understand the world around us. The more information we gather, the better informed we are. Familiarity breeds contempt is a saying that I very much disagree with due to my experience of stroke, of being a Fulbright scholar, of being an artist and working with scientists. I believe that familiarity needn't breed contempt but rather leads to what Senator Fulbright described as the inevitable acquisition of empathy understanding of ourselves and care for others. I often feel as though we're living in a world where divisive language, unsupported by evidence, is accepted as truth. It's like being shown the 1896 projection of a train coming into a station and being told that it's real. 
but it's not real, it's fake. It's just an illusion. I'd like to conclude with another story about a train coming into a station, then read something my daughter Cara wrote not long after my stroke. Recently, I was struggling to get off a train close to here at Glasgow Central, and a woman saw me struggling, and she held out her hand uh, to help me. And I took her hand, got safely off the train, and thanked her. Events like this have shown me that what we share is far, far greater than what divides us. When we see people struggling, we should reach out and offer them a hand. My daughter, Cara, was nine when she wrote what I'm about to read. Their class was asked to write about something that was familiar to them, that they cared about. I've been talking for quite a while about my stroke. Cara expressed it with much greater brevity. How to handle grown-ups who've had a stroke. One, if you are a noisy child, you might want to steer clear of these people. They can get grumpy because noise is very annoying and hurtful to them. Two, some grown-ups can swallow after their stroke and will have to spit into a cup for a while, so don't prepare them a tasty-looking meal because they can't eat it. Three, some grown-ups after their stroke won't be able to walk. Others won't be able to move their hand properly. After all, every stroke is different. And four, when you have a stroke, part of your brain is killed. So another part of your brain has to learn to take over that bit. One out of three people who have a stroke die. But luckily, it wasn't my dad. Car age nine. I hope this talk has shed a little light on familiarity. I've tried to suggest that familiarity can offer pathways to a greater understanding of other people and the world around us. It can introduce us to new and exciting experiences and ways of thinking that can often challenge our own. It can make us fully appreciate the rain and autumn leaves for the first time. Familiarity can even help reduce fear and make us feel safe and secure. And for people like me, it can offer the opportunity of having two lives. Thank you. Thank you.